Welcome back to our inquiry into the theology of the New Testament with special focus on the area of theological inquiry that we call Christology. Christology answers and addresses the question of the nature of the person and mission of Jesus, who we call the Christ. We are continuing in our outline with Roman numeral number five. This is, uh, <clears throat> we're on page four of the New Testament and early Christianity. We're talking about Christology. And Roman numeral five is Christological images of the New Testament. The sketches of Jesus in the various writers. A. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is the Son of Man, whose identity is hidden in what has come to be called the Messianic secret. He is the suffering Messiah who is revealed to be the Son of God in his suffering. Is that okay? Messianic secret. Messianic secret. Is the missing term there. And I it, put that in quotes, messianic secret. <clears throat> so can I ask a question right now? Because this is something yeah. that's very interesting to me. So I know that Jesus suffered. However, did he suffer just like a regular human being? Or did was there something else about it? Because because of his divinity and his and <clears throat> you know, and his, I would consider his enlightenment i guess that's that's probably the worst mm. word i could use but it, that's as close as i can and his gloriousness mm. did he have the same because you know we have the ordinary body and yes we have divinity but we were not in the capacity that jesus was in mm. so i question sometimes did jesus suffer horribly if i was on the cross and i had my hands nailed mm. would i have this would he have had the same pain that i would have had or was it something, could he like go past it? You know what I mean? I, yeah. I'm very fascinated about suffering wow. because I, I sometimes feel that maybe he, he had a different experience as a human being so enmeshed in his divinity. So, um, and I think sometimes we need to have Jesus suffer because we suffer as humanity, as humans. But I don't know if he suffered like we suffer. Well, so I, I can, well, because this word um, suffering in there is suffering. theology. This was a question from the earliest generations of Christianity. Mm -hmm. What was the extent of Jesus' suffering on the cross? Mm -hmm. And there were various answers given. And one answer that Christians gave was he didn't suffer at all. It was all an appearance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like he was a phantom. Uh, that's called docetism. docetism. Oh, I remember we talked about yeah. this before. Yeah, yeah. It was so, so docet, it seemed. It seemed. It that seemed, was, but it wasn't real. Yeah, it seemed that he was uh, human and that he was suffering. But, but he was purely a divine spirit, and it was all an illusion. Well, um, most, the majority of you rejected that. The majority of Christians wanted to say, we believe he was a historical human being, the son of Mary, and that he lived an ordinary human life. He, and out of that controversy and conversation came the notion from Pope Leo, of all people, a Roman a Pope. Uh, and the solution was, Jesus is fully human, and he's fully divine at the same time but he's just one person. So um, did his humanity suffer? Yes, that, that was the conclusion of the church. He suffered like any, because he wouldn't be fully human if he didn't suffer. And the incarnation and his life and passion had to be fully experienced as a human. It's the understanding of the early Christians. He identifies with our humanity in order that we might someday identify with his divinity. That's oh, kind that's of the prayer. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. right. Yeah. But God became human in order that humans could become divine. 
That's how they saw it. In I, the I have a related question about that. And I'm wondering is he was always divine or if the divinity happened when he, when he went through the experience with John the Baptist? Oh, I'm so happy, uh, Adelia and Sharon, with your questions because it shows me and Mother <laughs> Esther Diane that you're doing something. Uh, you're thinking theologically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're asking the right questions. And this is how theology is done and how it is born. Mm -hmm. So they ask these same, the same questions mm -hmm. that you're asking are brilliant because they had to ask those same questions in the second and third century. And the church took decades of discussion, mm -hmm. but they finally came to the conclusion, we can't deny his humanity, he was fully human. Mm -hmm. And to deny his purely human suffering would be in, in part to dishonor him for what he endured as a human being. So when he cried out on the cross, he was in real agony. It didn't just seem like it as that was an answer that was rejected. At the same time that he's fully human, he's also fully divine. Now we cannot, it's not a math equation. We can't be able to, that's beyond comprehension. Because we never, it's a paradox. We've never heard of such a thing before. Well, it's part of the great mystery. Right, that's, that's the mystery. There's something else to it, and that is oh, yeah. that the, um, the Greeks and the Romans did not think that the gods could suffer. Mm. And that's called being impassable. That the, mm. uh, the, pa wow. the passion is uh -huh. Christ's oh, suffering. Yeah. Well, if you're impassable, then you can't suffer. Mm. So... One of the truths of Christianity is this great mystery that, yes, Jesus really suffered as a human being, but somehow in that suffering, the, what is divine also, also suffer. experiences suffering. Yeah, and, and that's an incredible, that's an, a very incredible notion. Um, i got to tell you about a book that was written by a Japanese Christian who was in Japan when, in, Naga, in, I think, Nagasaki when the A-bomb was dropped. Well, he wrote a theological work called, and the title of it, this is interesting, and he was inspired because of what he saw in Japan after the dropping of the nuclear bomb. He titled the book, The Suffering of God. And he argues throughout the book that divinity, God suffers. And part of the purpose of the incarnation is so that God enters into the fullness of what we go through and a big part of what we constantly live with and haunts us almost every day is human suffering. Yes, yes. So history. that's why and then I'll come back and kind of question my own self in this thought because yeah. Jesus was that Mm -hmm. God becoming human right. in order to experience humanity, right. to experience the suffering in that, right. because God cannot. Right. I have, God has no, I mean, like you said, even, even talking about God, it's it's almost, almost sometimes impossible yeah. to talk about God it's is so beyond. Yeah, we are, it's bigger than the universe. But, so but I, I do see that. I do feel that. I do know that. And it's just like when Jesus just gets out of the boat and walks on the water. Right. You know, it's like he just does it. It's like he has that capacity to do right. that. So, <clears throat> well, uh, we came to believe in our Christology that he didn't do that in his human power, that he was doing that as a ordinary human by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So Jesus didn't just perform miracles. So back, back right? to the baptism, that's mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit that's showed right. up. He never does miracles before, before that. Before that. Mm -hmm. So... To say he was divine when he was born, maybe not. Well, 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 now, how do you explain yes. this? <laughs> I'm sorry. We well, knew we had a lot in common. Sharon's heresy is 
that um, Jesus's divinity manifests at his, you know, when he's baptized. That's when the Holy Spirit and he becomes the Son. Of descends God. and he becomes the Son of God, and that comes to be known as adoptionism, and the church rejects it. They. Re reject the idea or that at least the catholic church rejects it well, well no, and everybody else oh, goes everybody, everybody else oh, okay. down, down the road the, all right the whole universal christian church rejects adoptionism so when he was born he was born divine divine and well, he human. was okay he so was i divine, can i can i can, I can, I can it's the paradox yeah, but he was, so, was being carried in the womb that's why mary can be called the mother of god Here's, here's the word, adoptionism. Well, and the reason this is an important point um, you were explaining well, was um, the church decided to affirm equally the divinity and humanity of Jesus because it says in the New Testament documents that he was tested in every single way that we are. So this notion that he had to be fully human is very ancient in the church and the church decided we can't diminish that because when you're talking about his divinity how do we experience that except for through his humanity so was he full of the holy spirit before that experience with the baptism i don't know the answer to that it, the scriptures are silent that's a good question i'm just wondering if the holy spirit is the defining factor of divinity oh um, the church uh, might have thought about it in that way, but the church came to a different conclusion. And the conclusion, conclusion they come to, we're going to review in the next lesson. Okay. So you're anticipating. Okay. And also... But, but, the, but the questions that you're asking tonight follow a certain theme, I think. And you can correct me if I'm misunderstanding. You're both expressing your interest and concern about um, how is it possible for Jesus to suffer and to share in our humanity? That's that's the mystery for us. Well, and so I, I, um, you know we're not saying is. I'm not saying anything. When we say Jesus is fully human and fully divine, we're really not saying anything meaningful. All we're saying is what he's not. He's and here's what he's not. He's not half divine and half human. Mm -hmm. That's Hercules. Hercules was half. <laughs> Zeus was his father, uh -huh. but his mother was a human. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. so Hercules like is the son yeah. of a god and a human, half and half. So he's an hybrid. But Jesus is Jesus fully not a human. hybrid. No. Yeah, where, where I'm going, and we may have to wait for a future lesson, yeah. is that if the defining factor is the Holy Spirit right. coming to him, okay, mm -hmm. then are we as divine as Jesus when we receive the Holy Spirit? We oh. just had Pentecost. That's a, really, that's, a, that's a question. The, and the ancients did talk about this very exact question. See, you're thinking theologically. <laughs> that's what they did. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a it's a powerful thing to mm -hmm. even... You're asking yeah. the right questions. That's the question to the church. Could you ask it again and we'll try to answer Okay, it. we'll do it later. Another well, lesson. The, you know, the, the, the paradox or the issue is... <laughs> What sort of baptism do you have to undergo in order to be fully Christian? Mm. You know, to be baptized by water only or to be baptized by water and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yeah. And that's an issue that comes down in various denominations. Yeah, it's been as with a, us a as, long as time. It's a giant issue. We haven't resolved every question. The and that's why we have confirmation to uh, right. To yeah, yeah. And, and the, the yeah. theological yeah. enterprise is not ever, always yeah. incomplete. We don't and, have all the and answers. And how much of the of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is conferred on you when you are baptized? Mm. In and say in a Roman Catholic baptism, as opposed to a, a Pentecostal yeah. baptism, and which is 
more experiential, I think. It's hard, it's hard to explain what that is in relation to the sacraments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we just don't know. So much is unknown. Well, and some so of what we know is personal and can't be right. communicated. Well, that's it. Re that's the nature of religious experience. It's, it's, it's hard true. to explain. And Mark, uh, I, is that, I think in baptism, your Mark is Christ's own yeah, there is. In the back, um, it just in you've the been sealed with the uh, with sealed with, with the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit through and the waters of baptism, and, and you belong and, to Christ and now is, and forever. And you're in a cross on the foyer. Yeah, Mark is Christ. You belong to Christ. The baptism mm -hmm. means that you are the property of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The slave of Christ is what it is. <laughs> and Paul, in his letters, that's how he introduces himself. He doesn't give himself a big title it says Paul a slave of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. I, I, it's it's astonishing really okay. but you're asking the right questions and your questions have led me to see that you are doing what this class is dedicated to doing and that is to help you to begin thinking theologically mm -hmm. and that's precisely what you're doing so you're asking the same questions that our ancestors asked so we can tell you what how they answered it mm -hmm. and we we've been carrying that around with us yeah. but you're now but you're asking it as if it were for the first time it's a fresh question coming from you yeah that, that's i think that's really an achievement really most people don't think like that they can't think theologically. Mm -hmm. on, on to B. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yes. I yeah. Too much. No, no, no. That's no. I know. You know. Whenever I come to class, I slow everybody down because I don't know sticking my finger in everything. Yeah, but yeah. you're right on. <laughs> you're right on it, though. So you're not. It's not a rabbit uh, trail <laughs> at okay. all. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah. B, the Gospel of Matthew. So Jesus is portrayed. A little differently in all the gospels that's the point here um, in the gospel of matthew jesus is the son of david david that's really important that's the title the messiah. you'll see that in the gospel text they'll call out to him jesus son of david have mercy on me the messiah and as such is the new moses the good teacher rabbi whose instructions surpasses that of moses and the torah uh, because what happens is Matthew portrays Jesus coming down from a mountain like Moses mm -hmm. with the Beatitudes rather than the. And it wasn't, wasn't it also in the Gospel of Matthew, which is where Jesus looked across, he had, was coming over on the boat. And yeah. He looked across and he had compassion for the people because he saw they needed um, a teacher. Was that, that in Matthew? That's in Luke's. Oh, that's in Luke's. Yeah. Book. Okay. But I, I can give Oh, away. I see. Because, because uh, that has always moved me. That. Yeah. And that beautiful. It's just so, beautiful. So that, it's know, tender. That, mm -hmm. Yes. That, that's just so precious. Yeah. It is. That's Luke. And, and if we ever have that gospel, <laughs> You should preach on it and say that precisely. Oh, okay. That's that's a good homily point. <laughs> but in in um, that's coming up this summer. In Matthew, now. we've got Jesus and Mary having to take the infant Jesus. I'm sorry. We've got in the Gospel of Matthew, we've got Joseph and Mary taking the infant Jesus down into Egypt. Mm -hmm. To get away from Herod mm -hmm. and awesome. all the yeah. the kids that are being murdered, and that yeah, that is right. a an allusion back to what happened with the birth of Moses mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. of the children being murdered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, anyway, in Matthew we get down to um, Jesus in the mm -hmm. infant Jesus being down in Egypt mm -hmm. and the. To me, the telling comment is, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody who was Jewish <clears throat> would have known immediately that out of Egypt, I have called my son is 
reverberates with what happened with Moses, Moses. and in and the, oh, another mosaic. Illusion. Yeah, it's a mosaic illusion, and it's very important because in the Gospel of Matthew, obviously, Jesus is constantly being compared to Moses. Mm. Wow, that's a good uh, observation to be made. So he's the new Moses in the and the rabbi, the teacher, and yep. teacher. Okay, so the good teacher. Okay, see the Gospel of Luke and Acts, and of course we believe that Luke and Acts were written by the same author, and that it's a two volume set. Yeah. Uh, Jesus is the savior of all humanity, the compassionate healer who through his death, resurrection, and ascension, mediates the Holy Spirit upon his followers. Yeah, there you have it. And, um, and so you can see how today the church is very much influenced by Luke. Okay. D, the Gospel of John. Jesus is the pre-existent divine word. Divine word. That becomes incarnate. Jesus is the embodiment of the divine word, the means of God's creative activity, the son of God who is one, it's in quotes, one with the father. He is the cosmic Christ. And there are folks today who emphasize that idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, e, the apostle Paul, Jesus is Lord. In and through Jesus, God acts in a decisive way for the salvation of all humanity. Jesus is the last Adam. The new humanity, all things belong to him and are summed up in him. <clears throat> F, the writer of Hebrews, Jesus is the divine son through whom God created the world. The word is divine son. Jesus is the high priest whose sacrifice surpasses that of the temple sacrifices. Yeah, that, that's, that's a real break. And that's real strong in Hebrews. Yeah. yeah that's all of the, um, the imagery of the yeah. heavenly um, temple mm. and the heavenly temple sacrifices as opposed to the yeah it's a very earth, liturgical book. yeah earthly sacrifices mm. of the temple and g the writer of revelation jesus is the lamb of god slain for the sins of the world he is also the apocalyptic apocalyptic Messiah. a p o c as in cat a l y p t i C, the apocalyptic Messiah ushering in the day of the Lord. Very good. Oh, we finished uh, Christology. I, I just made a connection. You know how we were saying how um, the disciples were so clueless, especially mm. uh, during, the, you know, the, you know, the, um, um, you know, right after the, the Last Supper and, you um, well, if, if their idea was that gods don't suffer, mm -hmm. then they would not be able to comprehend what he was about to go through. This is totally new. Oh. I mean, we've gotten used to the idea, mm -hmm. you know. The, it, yeah, the we go up with it. We hear it all the time. Well, the, the whole idea of the crucifix, we see it all the time. It's, we're immersed in that culture. It's in our culture. But, then, but the Romans, it was so counterintuitive. Yeah. So and it yet, had no and yet sense it, at it, all. it won the day with it converted the Romans. That's the thing. It took 300 years. But the Romans finally succumbed to Christianity. They couldn't resist. But as it was happening, I can imagine, oh. you know, yes, oh. they all ran off. You know, yes, they they were it was shocked. They, they were freaked out. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, to say the very least. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Well, I'm pleased with your questions. <laughs> You're asking the right questions. Yeah, yeah. So and the only reason you knew to do that. I don't think you realize it is because you're beginning to be able to have enough material. <laughs>
to think theologically in your brain. That is your goal for us. And that's, that's really, and I know it's neurological. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, because I realized that so much is neurological, when I lost my memories uh, from the stroke, I started getting some back, you know, incidents and things. Very, it was very chaotic as they came back. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I was hit with very intense anxiety. And I thought, well, my father invested a ton of money for me to get advanced education. <laughs> I wonder if my brain has lost it all through the stroke. Because it's neurological. Yeah. So I worried about that for weeks. But then it started coming back. Yeah. So these patterns... Yeah, that where we, you know, take it in, take it in over and over again. It does something. It sinks in. It does. And now I also realize something else. I can say the Mass, mm -hmm. the entire Mass, without the sacramentary of text. Yeah. And that just amazes me that I have that capability. That is amazing. It, so much is in the brain. Mm -hmm. So this, I, I mentioned this because I'm coming to another point mm -hmm. and that is a question that you got very close to how much was jesus the man aware of his divinity mm -hmm. what was his consciousness this is a question we've been grappling with we really don't we can't get into the head of jesus mm -hmm. so i tend to go with the theologians who think that he was leaned more towards his humanity and maybe he thought his, his awareness of his divinity was, I'm going crazy. Yeah, he was on to something, though, because yeah. we know that even when he was 12 years old, yeah, he, he was well. asking for all that Oh, that's right. Luke yeah. is trying to say he had some awareness he, even then. Yeah, consciousness. so, you know, he was, he was grappling with something that was going on with him, right. even as a child. Yeah. And, and there was so much... From all this, the all the Jewish, um, all oh. of the scriptures. Oh yeah. So you know he he would take it all to heart. I would imagine. Well, and he was he was familiar with the scriptures because mm -hmm. we see him in dialogue and argumentation. Well, and even the prophecy that's in yeah. the scriptures, he would be aware of that. Right. You would think. You would think. Um, but I, we, we, the mystery still remains. We do not know the extent of this know? consciousness. Mm -hmm. How much did he really know? Because we have this idea that Jesus condescended. How do you say the word? Mm -hmm. Could you explain that better? I'm not, maybe condensation. You know what condensation is. I'm not sure what you're Condescended to become Condescended. To become human. He reduced himself to oh. become fully human okay. and that's an important part of the, our understanding of incarnation so in a but, sense it was really god that condescended because right. he's divine to, yeah to become mm -hmm. jesus mm -hmm. to because they are the same person and i do believe that yeah, which is your little so he's not a multiple personality no, disorder. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> and Jesus when he cried out to his father was not calling out to himself. Yeah, and mm -hmm. right, exactly, because he had that distinction of father. Because I think I really Relati it was because God is relational. So yes, yeah, right. Because I, I, you know, I just every once in a while I just think about this. You know, I just. He had the capacity to experience God tremendously and fully, more so than we right. really can, because it's right. just so big. But anyway, so his he was his whole life or his those three years mm -hmm. that we had of him, so to speak, right. had to do with how is he going to convey what he called the Father to us right and what was the best way that he could do it because it is such an overwhelming you know this really? god is just so huge gigantic right. how can i this is my reason why i'm here is to convey that that father that god mm -hmm. to terms that human beings can grasp right 
I think I'm he's come to reveal the Father to us. Yeah. Yes, right. and that was his whole purpose. Right, and, and we had, we were so ignorant. We had all kinds of bad ideas. So what <laughs> right. right. So can you? Oh but the God. consciousness of Jesus is yeah. ultimately, I think, unknowable mm -hmm. because I can't know the consciousness fully of another person. Like, I don't know. You're looking at me now, but I have no idea what you're thinking. <laughs> Good thing. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but you know, looks at me. I have no idea what she's thinking. I'm going. <laughs> yeah. Somehow I tried to guess with my wife. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, I, I know that he knew that. That was, you know, this whole, you know, I talked to, you know, I got to do the homily on um, when he was lost, when he was in the desert. I don't think he was lost. I think, um, you know, it's like, Okay, you know, the temptation of the devil was this, but really, I truly think that when he was there, that his whole reason was, okay, here I am. I just received those. I just mm -hmm. was baptized. And now I've got to plan my, my, I have to plan. I have to make a plan here. Mm -hmm. I have a three-year plan. What am I going to do? <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, and so, um, so he, he is, how, what am I going to say to these human beings mm -hmm. who I love? I've learned, I see them, I love them, I, I, I can see mm -hmm. their faults and their failures, but the love is so amazing. And how, what am I going to say to them to mm -hmm. convey the tremendous capacity of God and the love that God has for his, his children? So it's a, it's a pretty cool thing, you know, I really mm -hmm. think that, um, you know, would we have been able to do that if we were in that position, you know, and, you know, it's just like being a parent, you know, trying to convey the love of God to your children. It's a, uh, yeah, it's pretty heavy duty. It is. But it's exciting. It is. Yeah. You know, I think he did a dang good job. I think Jesus did a really good oh, job. Because <laughs> we're still talking about him all yeah. the time. And we're two millennia ahead. <laughs> I, to me, that's, you know, no one, few people can make that claim. Yeah, and you know, and then, you know, he had to put it into the language of the day. Right. So, you know, that's really important to know all the parables, everything mm -hmm. that he said. Yeah. It had to do with he was working with the audience. You know, it's like I was. Yeah, he was in a you are talking, context. you need to know who your audience is. Right. You need to know so that they can. You know, he wasn't talking to the Greek. Uh, well, he was eventually. You know, I mean, the word got mm -hmm. to the Greeks, but he wasn't talking to you know, to some other group, he was talking to the Jews. So he right. had to bring all that information into that particular mm -hmm. conversation so that they could have the capacity to understand it. And, um, and so I think he, I think he was brilliant. I think he did an oh, excellent yeah. job. And I, it's like, wow. wow he I he certainly mind. left a, an impression on his hearers. Yeah. Oh my God. I know it's just amazing. Well, the mystery of the relationship of the human to the divine in Jesus is something that we can't fully explain, along with what was the extent of his self-awareness and self-consciousness. I don't know. I sometimes imagine if I was in his position and I thought that I was divine, I'd be tempted to think I was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and, so. and there's a story in the Gospels in Matthew. I think mm -hmm. it's the 19th, no, the 16th chapter of Matthew, mm -hmm. where they're up in Caesarea Philippi in Lebanon. Jesus fled Galilee because his friend, John the Baptist, was executed. So he flees and becomes a refugee up in <laughs> Lebanon. Some people don't see this. But while he's there in Caesarea Philippi, he comes to his 12 disciples and he asks them the question, who do people say that I am? And they gave different answers. And he says, but who do you say that I am? Now, it's usually interpreted in this way. Jesus was taking this conversation as a teaching device so they would know who he is. I don't think so. I think it was the human Jesus struggling with his own doubts. Is it, is, am I really what I think I am? And so I feel like he's pleading with his disciples. Who do people say I am? But who do you say? You've been with me every day. And that's when Peter says, thou art the Christ. And from that moment on, Jesus changes his teaching radically. 
Before that, he never referred to his suffering and death. But after Peter made that confession and he was affirmed, he decided we're going back home. They were refugees, remember? We're going to Jerusalem. And the disciples think, you're nuts. They're going to kill you if you go there. Let's go die with him anyway. So that's the kind of impression he left on them. When he realized just who he was, then he knew he had to go to Jerusalem. That was his mission. It, to me, it, he's heroic because of that. Because he had all the human fears. I kind of think he wasn't sure. And that makes, makes him all the more brave. You know? Because, and also be, and and also because he had the experience of that fear yeah. and that concern, he you know he said be not afraid be at peace be all the afraid, time be at peace because he knew that was that's one of the biggest problems that we have yeah you know I mean I he's always saying fear, fear is not our shalom yeah, fear is our fear yeah is constantly used to manipulate us well into all fear, kinds of things. fear is the the, the, birth, the birthplace fear. of evil. Yeah. And sin. I think yeah. we sin because we're afraid. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, it, and that's, I think, why the Russians are at war with the Ukrainians because they're afraid of the West. Yeah. That's, that's right. really what's going on. Yeah. It's a, every, every war we've ever had has always been based on fear. Yeah. A lot of the things that happen in the world are all based on fear. Yeah. And, uh, and then if we don't, and that you know, you even said it earlier. You know, the hellfire and brimstone kept us in line. It did. <laughs> it worked for a no, thousand we, years. Oh, when we were talking earlier, we talked about that, right? When we were talking to Mariah, something about fear. Is yeah. that when we were talking about it? I don't remember, but I do. I do no, recall we had some conversation about the oh. fear of hell, and I okay. told you about Origin, who turned a fire hose right, on right. hell. Got rid so, of it. Um, yeah, so we I don't think, need it in our Christian theology, and the church says yes, we do. To, to exactly, because we were talking about it earlier. So I, was, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. we were talking about you, it, and it worked. Oh, you it worked. worked. Yeah. Yeah. You know it worked. <laughs> so what's our next group of? We're going on to the Holy Trinity. Do we have God here? and who is God? So well, do give, we have? Did I give you Holy Trinity no, already? No. Do you have any more comments about the mystery of the human and divine in Jesus? This is really the heart of our Christology. We affirm both. Is Jesus human? Yes. Is Jesus divine? Yes. And then we try to, in theology, to reconcile those. But the important thing for Christians, people of faith, is that we affirm both. So when a Gnostic Christian comes along, that's what we call them, and says, Jesus wasn't really human. We say he was fully human. And that became known as Catholicism. And then when someone else came along, and a guy named Arius and says, Jesus was not fully divine. He wasn't divine at all. Then the church responded by saying, he's fully divine. And that's where Pope Leo came up with the affirmation that's become Catholic orthodoxy. Even the Protestants did not dump it. They dumped everything else. <laughs> but, and that is that we have one person, Jesus of Nazareth, who is fully human and fully divine at the same time. And that was astonishing. That thought never came up in anyone's thinking before that in all of philosophy, right? Well, that was a unique construct, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Arius thought that, that Jesus was the son of God mm -hmm. and that he was a perfect creature. Mm -hmm. um, so you have God the Father as the supreme deity, and then under that, in effect, you've got God the Son, who is a perfect creature who was created by the Father. Oh, that, that, that's Arian. That's Arius. And, we rejected that. And, and that's rejected with the doctrine that 
that Jesus is of one substance with. We the say Father. it every Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, now, there is a small group of Christians that still hold to this view of Arianism. Yeah, they're out there. <laughs> they're called the Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -hmm. And they'll come to your door and tell you, you know, Jesus is not divine. Well, and I haven't had, thank goodness, I haven't had them to my door in a long, oh, long time. I, I always try they, to be gracious and kind, but when you are, they think you're interested in converting. And I told them, I'm sorry, I'm Catholic. I have no and I'm quite happy that way. I'm not going to change. If you want to visit me and talk about religion, I'll be happy to do that. But I don't want to waste your time. And that's the last time I usually see them. <laughs> <laughs> so um, shall we start on um, the Holy Trinity? The, yes. What is God? And that's a great God? idea. Um, number Roman numeral number one on in this new set of notes. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity, in a sense, was the necessary outcome of the theological christological development development is a key word of early christianity in the three centuries following the apostolic era a as the christian movement continued to penetrate the hellenistic world remember that's based on those this are the greek that's how us yeah the greek world the greek the, the world. hellenistic world Christian thinkers were increasingly challenged to explain the gospel message and its implications in the terms and categories of thought of the Hellenistic cultural and intellectual environment. So terms and categories. Boy, that's a big sentence. I to the words there. <laughs> and environment. Yeah. Well, yes, because they had one foot in the Jewish yeah. And so how do they yeah. pull that out? And Two cultures. I, uh, yeah. What Paul Very did different. was brilliant to yeah. bring them both together. Like that. Number one, the challenge was to accomplish this in such a way as to make the Christian message understandable and acceptable to the Hellenistic mind, while at the same time not diluting, distorting, and, dis and diminishing the original original apostolic deposit of faith. The words are deposit of faith. You'll run into that expression again and again. What's the deposit of faith? <laughs> the concept, number two, the concept of the Holy Trinity was developed in order to address the problem of the early Christian church's need to maintain its faithfulness to biblical monotheism. Monotheism, yes. Well, at the same time, affirming the divinity of Jesus. The divinity. Especially in their proclamation of Jesus as Lord. Three. The doctrine of the Holy Trinity became necessary in order to avoid tritheism. Um, that is the belief in three gods. The kind of polytheism. Yeah. yeah. While at the same time affirming the divine nature of the Father. The divine nature of him. Of the Father of Christ and of the Holy Spirit. As well as affirming the differentiation. Differentiation. Is that a word? Uh, mm -hmm. It's a great word. Oh, good. I'm differentiation good. of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit within the one God. D, the dogma of the Holy Trinity can be stated in, in this way. Within the nature of the one true God, there exists three co-eternal and co-equal persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sharon, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, we have an icon in our chapel of the Blessed Trinity. Do we still have that somewhere? I could. I didn't know where we hung it. We did so many things. We, you and I had a conversation. We had, Holy Trinity is the next um, right. liturgy. Right. And I was researching it. it and I was working I was, for the sacristy. So. And I've never seen one. Because and, and it, it was given to us years ago by um, uh, Brian and Jerry. Is it on a 
It's a big, colorful plaque. It's like 14 inches wide. Oh, oh inches. well, if I had seen it before, I would not have recognized it and known what it is. Yeah. But because I researched it, now yeah. I know what it's it is. It's a three angel sitting around a table. You know what I'm talking about? I have a little one that's personal. Oh, yeah, we've talked about that. And, and then, but there's a bigger one. We used well, to hang in the church. You and I are talking about two different things. I think we are. Because there's a Celtic a knot, which is, um, which is, you know, like three shapes in a row. Right. That's not the one. I'm that's thinking. not what you're talking about. But it's it, th this icon depicts three angels sitting around a table having a conversation. Right. I remember we had that because I remember you referred to it. Yeah. Well, that was years ago. Years ago. I had it in the church for years, but I can't find it. I don't know what became of it. I don't know. I've I don't seen, know. I've seen well, because we, it's one thing that we put up and take down, you mm -hmm. know. It's got to be in that the confessional closet, or, or I don't know. Or how how that, large is it? It it's a significant icon, not massive, but it's bigger than 11 most. Eleven by fourteen. Yeah, what? Eleven by fourteen. That's probably it. That sounds about right. Eleven by fourteen. Be looking for it. And it has three angels on it, sitting around a table having a conversation, and they're each dressed in a different color. Right. Right. Okay, I'm, I'm wondering, sorry. That's that's we're looking at the this mm -hmm. tritheistic notion of God. Mm -hmm. uh, page two: the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. However, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. <laughs> Oh, it's so it's very they're trying to define very exactly what you can think and what you can't think about. And if you want to go it's splitting hairs with definitions, but that's what happened with medieval theology. If you ever want to go to YouTube, there is a very humorous um, Lutheran mm. um, what do I want to call it? Um, animation. Yeah, yeah uh, a cartoon. It, uh, yeah, it's a cartoon explaining the uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, <laughs> and it's um, it's great. Really, how'd you find this? Oh, I eons ago I found it, and I didn't look it up ahead of time. Is it called called what is it called? The Lutheran animation of the Trinity, yeah, or some? I can't. You'd have to kind of hunt around, I think, a little bit to find it, but I might be able to. Yeah, you could. Yeah, that would after, be fun. After we finish tonight, I'll see if I can yeah. find it um, for you to look at tonight. It's it's classic. Um, and then you you did hand out this uh, the Creed of Saint Athanasius. Did we bring it tonight? It, is that the one that you? Yeah, it might be it. That's the Chalcedonian Christology. We should have that. What you're talking about? That's the thing by Pope Leo, isn't it? Oh no, he influenced it. I, I don't know what this is. Diane. Yeah, that's it. Oh, that, that's a handout. All right. Okay. It's on the second page. Now we uh, don't publicly uh, express this. The language is too. Ornate. But copies. anyway, um, it's still, <laughs> these are important documents. Not the because it really defines very carefully. And I think we should read through um, the Kikunke uh, Volt. Uh, yeah, that's the, the Creed of St. Athanasius, and you'll see how precise the definition of the language is. Now, this was originally written in Greek, so the language would have been even more technical and, and precise, because that's the nature of the Greek language. They like preciseness. They dislike ambiguity. <laughs> so, shall I read it out loud? I was wondering if you would mind. Okay, the Creed of St. Athanasius. Whosoever will be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith, except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, 
without doubt he shall perish everlasting. That sounds like a typical medieval statement. <laughs> and the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. That, oh, that's brilliant. That's, that's, that's good Catholicism. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Could I pause it at this moment? When it says Godhead, just write divinity. So it, it could read, but the divinity of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Did you like that word Holy Ghost? Yeah. is all one the glory equal the majesty co-eternal such as the father is such is the son and such is the holy ghost the father uncreate the son uncreate and the holy ghost uncreate so none of them were created the father incomprehensible the son incomprehensible <laughs> and the holy ghost incomprehensible oh my. yeah the Father eternal, the Son eternal, and the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet, they are not three eternals, but one eternal. <laughs> so also, there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated and one incomprehensible. So also, the Father Almighty, the Son Almighty, and the Holy Ghost Almighty. And yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. <laughs> so the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, oops, the Son Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord. Mm -hmm. And yet not three lords, but one Lord. For like as we are compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be both God and Lord, so are we forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there be three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is the Father alone, is sorry, the Son is of the Father alone not made, not created, not begotten. The Holy but, begotten. But, begotten. but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. I like that word. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this trinity, none is a four or after other. None is greater nor less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal. Is that it? No, it keeps going. Oh, it keeps going. So that in all things, as is aforesaid, the unity in trinity and the trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved must thus think of the Trinity. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is a Son and man. God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who, although he be God and man, yet he is not two, but one Christ, one not in conversion of the Godhead in flesh, but by taking of the manhood into God. One altogether, not the confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ. 
who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. At whose coming all men shall rise again in their bodies, with their bodies, and shall give account of their own works. And they that have done good shall go to life after everlasting, and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith, which except a man believe faithfully, he cannot be saved. So you can see why we don't publicly recite this one. <laughs> But, every and despite that language, but what's really important is that there's some really good theology, yes, it's state, good. theological yes. statements being yes. here, and yes. it's it's something that has been authoritative in the life of the church. So if you go through and analyze his language, yeah, and all that stuff, yeah, and, and all uh, the, I don't angry. like all the threats. Well, it's incomprehensible. That's right. the whole thing. Yeah, that's that's all point. you can do is believe it. You take right. it in and believe it. Right. And and what it makes me think about is that okay, time is a human thing, not a God thing. Right. Space is a human thing, not a God thing. Mm -hmm. And that, that it's, we cannot comprehend it. Right. It's, it's, it's like, we, our, we don't our, have a frame of our, reference. We don't have, well, and we, our brains cannot comprehend certain, right. we have boundaries that don't allow right. for it to be really understood or comprehended. So our hour has ended and we'll oh. begin next week at number two, the divine nature. Okay. In this. That's just oh, a great I natural have, stopping. I gotta get it on. So, so there's uh, ruffles wow. and Fritos. Oh, great. That's so, great. So and we're going to say a prayer? We're, you're going to say a prayer. Oh, I'm yeah. going to say a prayer in the and name of the Father Christ. and of the Son and of the Holy Christ. Spirit. The Lord is with you. And also, also with you. let us pray with eyes lifted up and hearts open. We express our gratitude to you, O God, for the enormous amount of love you pour onto us through your son, Jesus, by means of the Holy Spirit. We ask for your blessing in the coming days of this week, and may we ponder what we have learned tonight, and may it deepen our love for you and for each other. We offer this prayer through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> and blessings on Mother Yeti, who's... who's uh, Bell's going to go back to bed as soon as she says goodbye. <laughs> and, um, and Yay, you liked a Smith said, Wigglesworth. And we said, well, yeah. out to you and yeah. Mother Martha, and I hope that you're having a wonderful time. And oh, also, next family, week, we're going friend. to skip next week, right? Yes, and we're going to skip next week. No class next, next week. No class. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Sleep in. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. We love you. Uh, Wow. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, it's like having her here.